Good afternoon. It's indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be here and speak to people who will be deciding what our health budgets are going to be in about 10 years' time. So let me make my pitch, hoping to catch your attention and some sympathy for the health sector. So I've been told that my talking time is about an hour. I would have, as a student, protested against that. But since I've been given that luxury, I'll still try and deal with some of the issues because I don't think I'll have such a captive crowd of economists, or young economists, ever again to address. So do feel free, however, to challenge me on any particular statement I may make in between or ask a question. But I would like to keep many of the discussion points towards the end because some of the points may actually come up which you want to ask during the latter part of the lecture. But let's make it as interactive as possible and we'll carry on from there. Uh, basically, the theme of the lecture that I would like to give and the discussion I'd like to have is related to health in the context of India's development but bringing in equity as an important dimension because often development is pursued merely as economic growth but inclusive and sustainable development is something that I would like to look at in terms of health and these interconnections are things that I would like to really bring to your attention. Health has now become fairly central to the global development agenda, having featured in three out of the eight Millennium Development Goals, but having come very centrally in the Sustainable Development Goals as well, with universal health coverage providing the platform for health action in a number of areas. And universal health coverage has become the rallying cry of the World Health Organization now. And we, as a country, have also subscribed to this Sustainable Development Goal and expect to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. The driving force for universal health coverage has come from two different streams. One, which looks at the intrinsic value of health where we feel that a person, in order to have well-being, functionality, not have dependence, to be able to deal with a lot of things on one's own, but at the same time enjoy social and family relations, all of that requires good health, and that's the intrinsic value of health. And that is where the rights perspective comes in. But there is also the instrumental value of health, where health enables you to get education, gain an occupation, get income, become productive and contribute to economic growth. And that's where it becomes a developmental imperative from the economic sense. And both of these converge in the concept of universal health coverage, which says that people in society must all have the ability to enjoy good health without hindrance. Now, in the whole philosophical construct, equity becomes also very important. Clearly, when Jeremy Bentham proposed the utilitarian hypothesis of the greatest good for the greatest number, which most economists have adopted as their credo and created the selfish man, we also recognize that that has limitations. Obviously, when we look at the greatest good for the greatest number, we are not looking at people with disabilities or the elderly people and so on. So we marginalize certain segments. But John Rawls said that everybody must have equality of opportunity, raise the idea of justice, but interpreted it in the context of equality of opportunity, particularly in the specific set of, setting of United States of America, where the African Americans were being greatly discriminated. But as we will see later on, even that has had some limitations. And now Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen have come up with the capabilities argument and 
which Sen elaborates in his idea of justice. And they have actually advocated now it as a right. And this is well summarized in the context of health by Sridhar Venkatapuram, who says, a well-ordered society would ensure that all individuals have the capability to be healthy and at a level that is commensurate with human dignity in the modern world, which is their right. But we also recognize that these are also dependent upon other capabilities, like education, for example, gender equity. And therefore, Martha Dusbaum refers to it as a cluster of capabilities. And Sridhar Venkatapuram calls it a meta-capability. But whatever we call it, we recognize that health and economic development must take equity into consideration. And when we talk of health, we are not actually divorcing nutrition, though the government of India may in its wisdom decide to put nutrition with women and child development and health in a different ministry. We recognize that these are intrinsically linked and all of them have interrelationships bidirectionally. And in terms of how nutrition itself matters to economic development, let me quote a Nobel laureate in economics, Robert Fogel, who said, improved nutrition leads to economic growth, which in turn can permit greater investment in public health, and that can stimulate and spur further economic growth. And he estimated that 50% of improved economic growth in Britain during 1790 to 1980 was due to improved nutrition and he attributed to social policies during 1790 to 1930. Of course, he didn't particularly mention the colonial history where Britain's nutrition improved and India and Ireland had famines, but that's a different story. But nevertheless, we have seen that nutrition also matters very much to economic growth of a society. Now, in terms of economic growth and life expectancy, which is one of the key indicators of a healthy society, we have the Millennium Preston Curve, described first in 1973, but popularized greatly by another Nobel laureate in economics, Angus Deaton, who showed that as per capita income rises, life expectancy would rise particularly sharply when the per capita income is low and the rise is happening. But after a period, by the time you reach about $4,000, $5,000 of per capita income, it sort of plateaus off and the incremental benefit is very little. But we do recognize that life expectancy is determined to some extent by economic growth in the society. But we also recognize that at the same level of per capita income, Countries can exhibit marked difference in their life expectancy based upon the equity levels, whether it's Gini coefficient or any other index. And here we find, for example, that there is a gap in the life expectancy between the United States of America and the aggregate of the OECD. And particularly when you look at Japan at 83.8 years and the United States of America at 78.7 years, then you see the gap fairly evident. And we recognize, as indeed Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson pointed out in their book, The Spirit Level, that unequal societies pay a price in health, as well as in many other social indicators for that matter. They pointed out that mortality is related more closely to relative income within countries than to differences in absolute income between them. And national mortality rates tend to be lowest in countries that have smaller income differences and thus have lower levels of relative deprivation. Now they pointed out that it's not only the poor who suffer in such countries, the rich also suffer. The rich in countries which have greater income inequality and other social inequalities will have worse health indicators than the rich in countries with an equivalent per capita income. So inequality affects everybody in society. That you can understand easily for infectious diseases, but you can also understand for a variety of other things. So this emphasis on equality becomes very important in the context of health. 
and in India there is a reality check. The num in 19 uh, in 2018, uh, if you look at the Huron Global Rich List and the Oxfam report to the World Economic Forum, the number of Indian billionaires rose from 100 to 131. And the combined wealth of Indian billionaires rose by 49%. And the richest 1% bagged 73% of the country's wealth. But 67 crore Indians comprising the country's poorest population saw their wealth increase only by 1%. Whereas the billionaires saw their wealth increasing by 49%. So in this appalling scenario of gross inequalities, what is India's health like? So how healthy is India? Let's start with some good news first. Life expectancy increased from 32 years at the time of independence to 68.2 years in 2016. And there was a 10-year gain between 1990 and 2016 and 25 year period. Maternal mortality ratio dropped to 130 in 2014-16 compared to 167 in 2011-13. But if you compare with where we started in 1980 in 677, well, then the drop appears quite dramatic indeed. In 10 years, between 2006 and 16, child immunization rate went up by 18%. And India has successfully eradicated polio. Per capita disease burden, measured by the age standardized disability adjusted life year rate, dropped by 36.2% from 1990 to 2016. Now, the disability adjusted life year rate, for those who may not be entirely familiar with it, is a summative measure of premature mortality of life years lost due to premature death and years lived with disability weighted for the degree of disability therefore it captures both mortality as well as morbidity across all diseases across all ages and therefore it's a summative figure which enables comparison over time as well as between countries so here we have seen a 36.2 percent decrease which appears again quite remarkable. But there are paradoxes of India's health which stare at us. The population health indicators of India lag behind our economic growth. And while we can boast of world-class urban tertiary care facilities which advertise for and indeed attract medical tourism, we have fairly appalling facilities in primary health care, in rural areas and even urban areas, and even much of secondary care in many of the towns is not really up to mark. India is the world's pharmacy exporting a large number of drugs. Yet, in 2014, out of 55 million Indians who were pushed into poverty by healthcare expenditure, 38 million were pushed into poverty because of unaffordable expenditure on medicines. So, why are these paradoxes occurring? Now even when you look at life expectancy and we did celebrate a certain level of increase, we are reminded that India has the second lowest life expectancy in South Asia. And recently Times of India had the story in which we had even slipped from rank 119 to 120. And if you look at where Sri Lanka is, rank is 66, Bangladesh is 91. Nepal is 110, India is 120, Pakistan is 124. We are just a nose ahead of Pakistan in this region. And when we look at under 5 mortality rates in the states of India, again, we did record a drop in child mortality. But even with that drop in 2016, under 5 mortality rate in children was five times higher than in Sri Lanka and China. And within India, you have a huge disparity with the rate in Assam being four times the rate in Kerala, same country. And when we look at immunization rates, we did say that the immunization rates went up by about 18%. But with that, it has reached 62 to 64%. Whereas many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have above 90%. Many of them have 95%. And even at the height of its civil conflict, 
Sri Lanka had about 98-99%. So that is a problem at the moment. Now I am not trying to dampen your spirits by drowning you in a deluge of dismal statistics. The economics is called the dismal science. But, yeah, go ahead. For the, for the children, complete immunization. For yeah, some immunize like for DPT, it's been about 78 to 80 percent. Yeah. There is data available also on separate vaccines. Yes. So, but we, I also keep saying that India's national bird is the peacock and not the ostrich. We can't hide our heads in the sand. We have to recognize the problems and then deal with it. Right. And same thing about nutrition. Here, yeah. though there has been improvement over a period of time, we also find that even in the last NFHS survey, about 38% of our children were stunted, short for age. About 21% were wasted in terms of low weight for height. And 35% were underweight, weight for age. So we find that there is a huge burden of undernutrition which apart from making them susceptible to a variety of diseases in childhood, it also is a huge deprivation of cognitive power, a loss of brain power for the country, a country which says that we will ride the wave of our demographic opportunity to greater development. If you are going to have people with a loss of cognitive power because of undernutrition, that's going to have a huge economic cost as well. So, and apart from the fact that undernutrition in childhood predisposes you to early onset of cardiovascular disease and diabetes later on in adult life. So the shadow is cast long as well. So the disease burden rate from malnutrition in India is 12 times higher than in China. And the disease burden rate from unsafe water and sanitation is 40 times higher than in China. Now in 1962, India had a higher per capita income than China. Of course, China's economy took off later on for a variety of reasons. But even at that level, China invested much more in nutrition, water, sanitation and education, which actually improved their health indicators quite quickly compared to our own neglect. Now, within states, there is a huge disparity. There are eight what are called empowered action group states. You can see them on the uh, picture plus Assam. They account for 50% of India's population, 59% of the childbirths, but they account for more than 70% of infant and under five deaths and 92% of maternal deaths. Nine states of India accounting for 92% of maternal deaths. Now you can see the huge amount of inequity within the same country in terms of health status. And even as we are bemoaning what is happening to our mothers and children, we recognize that there is also a very rapidly advancing wave of what we call non-communicable diseases, which are, I mean, while the others were diseases of underdevelopment, these are diseases of maladapted modernity, where you have cardiovascular diseases, cancers, diabetes, chronic respiratory diseases, and now you can add mental health as an add-on, but these were the four that were described as the classic NCDs. And whether we are mentioning it in terms of dallies or whether we are mentioning it in terms of deaths percentage, we have seen a dramatic shift between 1990 and 2018 where the diseases of underdevelopment, the so-called pre-transitional diseases became less in contribution in terms of their magnitude as well as and NCDs rose very rapidly, particularly cardiovascular disease. And these, propose, these pose a developmental dilemma. You may say, well, how does it matter if somebody dies of heart attack, somebody has to die of heart attack, something anyway. So, people will die of heart attack at the age of 70, 80, how does it matter? But if they die after the age of 80, after a full and fulfilled life, no problem. For the family, yes. But for <laughs> society, may not be. But majority of the deaths are occurring because they are occurring at a much younger age, they have a huge cost. 
56% of the deaths occur below 70 years. 40% of the deaths occur below 65 years. The average age of the first heart attack in India is about 50 years, about 15 years earlier than in the West. And this has a tremendous consequence for productivity, productive years of life lost. The Harvard uh, the School of Public Health and the World Economic Forum estimated that between 2011 and 2030, India would st stand to lose $4.58 trillion because of NCDs, because of healthcare costs and lost productivity. And of course, in India, we also have a special predilection for some cardiovascular diseases, some cancers and certain risk factors. Like, for example, we have much greater propensity for diabetes for a variety of reasons, diet, low physical activity. We consume more oral tobacco, so we see a lot more oral cancers. And we see indoor air pollution, which is the kitchen's curse, where women burning biomass fuels is not only affected, but the babe in her arms and the toddler playing around are also victims likely to get pneumonia and she is likely to get a variety of diseases as well. We also recognize that these are not entirely genetic issues, that Indians have a special propensity for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. In our own studies, we have demonstrated that rural and urban differences exist. But interestingly, in some of our factory studies, we found that people who had migrated from rural areas to urban areas, compared to their rural siblings who stayed back, within five years, the urban migrants had acquired a risk profile very similar to that of long-term urban residents, whether it's blood pressure, body mass index, waist circumference, insulin resistance, blood cholesterol, blood pressure, everything. And therefore, we just cannot think only in terms of genetic propensity, but of strong environmental influences that affect the expression of whatever susceptibility that exists. So when even cardiology colleagues of mine and apart from of people in the media say, oh, Indians are accursed because of their genes, I say rather than blame the genes we share, let us look at the genes we wear. Do we still fit into last year's genes? So that's the question we should ask. Okay. And there is also a progressive reversal of the social gradient for risk factors. That means most of these epidemics start in the rich and the more educated, more affluent sections, but over a period of time the social gradient reverses and the poor and the less educated become the dominant victims and we'll see why. So where did we go wrong? So when we look at health, frequently people in health look only at the health system. Is the health system functioning well or not? And there are elements described by WHO, workforce, infrastructure, drugs, vaccines and technologies, financing, information systems, governance, all these are important. But we also recognize that the social determinants of health, the economic determinants of health and the commercial determinants of health influence health far more importantly than actions taken within the health sector. For example, at the societal level, water, sanitation, food system, environment, social stability, development, all of these matter. At the personal level, income, education, occupation, social status, gender, participation in social networks, all of these are also conditioned by a variety of societal factors, but they express themselves mostly in personal attributes. They matter. And of course, the political and economic system which makes the choices both within the health system as well as in the social, economic and environment, commercial determinant space, that matters. And even if we tease out some of the specific elements of the health system, like health financing, for example. Well, in terms of total expenditure on health, India spends less than many other countries. But particularly in terms of public financing, governmental health expenditure, India spends very little. India ranks 176 out of 191 countries in the government health expenditure or public financing. And in terms of out-of-pocket expenditure, India ranks 182 out of 191 countries. So we are in the list of 10 countries with the highest out-of-pocket expenditure. And 
you may say, okay, what about all these wonderful health insurance schemes that are going around? You have had Rashtriya Swasthya Bhima Yojana, you have had Arogya Shri, you had the Vajpayee scheme, you had the Kalainar scheme and God knows what all. Shouldn't they have reduced some of these out-of-pocket expenditure? Should they not have reduced some of the financial burden? Well, here is a study comparing NSSO 2004 and 2014. I mean, some of my own colleagues in PHFI had done similar studies, but this has the watermark of a government-recognized economist, Shamika Ravi, who is a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. And an alumnus of this school. And an alumnus of this school. Salute. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, she has pointed out in her comparison that if you compare these two NSSO studies, impoverishment caused due to poor health has remained unchanged at approximately 7% of the population. That is between 2004 and 2007. But the population has grown in between, so the numbers have actually grown. But very importantly from the point of view of financial protection, she said, I mean this is the, the group that fell below the poverty line remained at 7%. They said, Basically, if you take any of the three indicators, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, some uh, good background music is fine. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. I mean, uh, it's always nice to have a little bit of music. In fact, some of the surgeons I know have music in the theater while they're operating. So, fine. Okay. So, uh, as long as we're not forced to dance, <laughs> well, if you take any of the three indicators of financial protection, which is total real out-of-pocket expenditure and probability of catastrophic health expenditures and impoverishment caused by health expenditures, any of the three, in none of the three there was any benefit demonstrated. So, that's because of a variety of reasons because of add-on expenditures by the hospitals, the low cost of coverage of RSBY, 30,000, though some of the state health insurance schemes did provide up to three la 2 lakhs, 2.5 lakhs. But the most crucial factor was 70% of the out-of-pocket expenditure is because of outpatient expenditure. And 70% of that is because of medicines. And none of these schemes covered any of that. Now, if you took a look at the health workforce, there you find a huge maldistribution. It's exactly the reversal of the urban-rural population ratio. You find two-thirds of the people in urban areas. And counterintuitively, even Irish practitioners, whom you'd logically expect to be seen more in the rural areas, they're also urban aggregated. So there is again a problem in terms of health services. Now, in terms of bidirectional relationships, obviously, economic growth and population health are bidirectionally related. Uh, this has been a bit of a change, though, from the 90s after the Macroeconomics Commission, the Investing in Health Commissions, and so on and so forth. Because of that, before that, many of the economists sort of believed that health will passively respond to economic growth and that health is essentially a, a cost which has to be borne, but was not seen as an important accelerator of economic growth. That has changed considerably and the bidirectional relationship is well recognized. But we in the health sector have very clearly recognized that there is also a bidirectional relationship between poverty and individual health. If you are poor, you are more likely to fall ill. If you fall ill, you are more likely to get poor. Simple. And this is very simple very easily understood in terms of infectious diseases, tuberculosis and malaria, high maternal mortality, high child mortality, nutritional disorders with the macronutrients and micronutrients, and lower life expectancy. But even in terms of non-communicable diseases, we see more cervical and oral cancers among the poor, more chronic respiratory disease among the poor, and rising cardiovascular diseases among the poor, as well as diabetes now. The prevalence of diabetes in the slums of Delhi is about 10 to 12 percent now. Increasing mental health disorders, addictions and substance abuse. And all of these are driven by poor diets, 
tobacco and alcohol, stress, air pollution, exposure, and climate change vulnerability. And even in terms of health services, low levels of health literacy, so that you don't have a health-seeking behavior, you can't protect your own health because of low levels of knowledge, limited access to health services, affordability barrier to seeking health care, discriminant attitude of health care providers who sort of treat the poor badly, opportunity cost of seeking care, lost wages for the person as well as for the family, poverty inducing effects of out-of-pocket spending, whether it's outpatient or catastrophic hospitalization. But we also recognize that this is not limited to a single generation, that there's an intergenerational transmission of some of the impact of inequality. The so-called Barker hypothesis or the Barker forestall hypothesis said and showed with a number of supportive studies including from our own New Delhi birth cohort showed that if there was intrauterine malnutrition and early life malnutrition in the first two years, then you are likely to have even with normal or supplemental nutrition a rebound adiposity, more of fat rather than lean muscle mass up to the age of 12 and that sets the stage for early onset of heart disease and diabetes even in their 20s and 30s. And this has been shown also in the New Delhi birth cohort uh, here where we studied uh, Okay. See, the New Delhi birth cohort was actually established in Savdarjang Hospital by Professor Shanti Ghosh in the 60s, essentially to study the growth curves. They studied from the time of pregnancy to, of course, the newborn and followed up the children up to 14 years of age. Essentially, the idea was to look at the growth curves in Indians but very well documented. But in 1989 when I met Professor David Barker and then first heard about the Barker hypothesis which was gaining ground that intrauterine malnutrition predisposes to adult disease, what are called the developmental origins of adult disease. Then we contacted Professor Santosh Bharga who had sort of carried on that cohort after Dr. Shanti Ghosh and together established along with Dr. Barker and others a study in which we retraced the contacts and found out many of the children had grown up and then reassembled part of the cohort who were available and then started studying them and following them up and following their children and therefore we have at least three generations now assembled and who are being studied. So here it's very clear that the highest prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes was in subjects who were in the lowest third of the group at birth with respect to BMI, with respect to BMI at 2 years and the highest at age 12 years. So those who went on to develop diabetes mellitus were essentially those who became relatively obese relative to themselves. So that was the problem, the rebound adiposity. But there is also an intergenerational impact of undernutrition which can go beyond these two generations. Now if you have a pregnant mother and some of these effects, what Barker said, are what are called epigenetic. That is how the genes are expressed. There is no structural change in the gene, but how the gene covering is altered in terms of its expression. And these epigenetic changes can be caused by a variety of things, nutrition particularly, but also tobacco exposure, pollution and so on. Now, if you have a pregnant mother who is undernourished, the girl fetus in utero is bound to have those kind of epigenetic changes and may end up disadvantaged. But the girl fetus is also having oocytes, which are eggs. And the genes there also can be getting altered in terms of their expressibility and expression. So this can actually transmit not only to the unborn child but to the yet to be conceived child. So it can actually go into, the, so this is an intergenerational transmission of inequality. Now we also studied the reversal of the social gradient in India because in the 1970s Dr. Padmavati and others 
were saying that it is the middle class and the rich in Delhi who have more of heart attacks. But we started seeing the trend changing in the 90s and in a 10 factory study when we studied and this were from tea gardens in Assam uh, to titanium factory in Kerala and aeronautics factory in uh, uh, Bangalore to automobile factory in Pune and the cycles in uh, Haryana and so on. So in a widespread of industries when we studied the impact of educational class on a variety of cardiovascular risk factors, it was very clear that virtually every single risk factor was higher in those with the lowest educational class, that is primary or illiterate, as compared to those with postgraduate education or higher education. So already the social gradient started reversing. And when we did a case control study of acute myocardial infarction, this is a PhD student from Harvard who came to do PhD with us with joint uh, mentorship. And she went ahead and did it in Bangalore and Hyderabad, uh, Bangalore and Delhi. Again, for the first myocardial infarction, education, those with no education compared to those with highest level were at a greater risk of getting a heart attack. Even those with a lower income were at a greater risk of getting a heart attack than those with a higher income, education appeared to be the stronger effect which is expected because education can trump income effect also. So we published much of these data in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences in the USA showing that as socioeconomic and health transitions advance within each country, that is as the epidemics mature, the social gradient for NCD risk factors and for NCD events progressively reverses till the poor become the most vulnerable. And this happens virtually for every single risk factor. Now, the poor smoke much more tobacco. Tobacco started in the fashionable smoking room, rooms of London clubs. Now it's there in every street corner kiosk. Fat rich foods were only the feudal lord's table. Now you find trans fat with junk foods available in small sachets everywhere and unhealthy edible oils are being consumed by the poor but the rich consume healthier edible oils. The rich now consume much more fruit and vegetables with their knowledge of risk factors and so called lifestyle issues they undertake more leisure, leisure time physical activity. They give up smoking first. So the social gradient reverses and the poor get stuck ultimately on the bandwagon as the most vulnerable victims. Even in terms of physical activity, while the manual laborer is somewhat protected, many of the others are no longer that protected because mass transport is available. But even otherwise, we were discussing now the fairly high rates of overweight and obesity in Delhi. They are seen in almost all social classes. And in terms of physical activity, it's a paradox of modernity that previously used to be paid for doing physical work. Now you have to pay for doing physical work. You have to buy gym memberships, right? Okay. So health beyond health care. So what do we do about health care? Yes, but what about health beyond health care? Where are the social determinants and other determinants coming in? If you look at fruit and vegetable consumption, India has about 130 to 140 grams of fruit and vegetable consumption per capita among the lowest whereas WHO recommends up to 500 grams per day and when you say 130 grams per capita average then you can think of what the poor are consuming actually. Air pollution. In 2015 1.8 million deaths occurred due to air pollution and 1.1 million deaths due to ambient air pollution and 0.7 million deaths due to household air pollution. Now for Deliates, I don't have to talk about air pollution, right? But who are the most vulnerable to both forms? Those who spend most of the time outdoor or most of the time in the kitchen burning biomass fuel, the poor. Similarly, climate change. Climate change has huge impact on health. Your heat affects both physical and mental. Heat stroke related deaths, heat exhaustion, dehydration. Mental, it's been shown that the risk of intra-group as well as inter-group conflict goes up as temperature rises even with every degree rise in temperature. You not only get hot in 
the weather that you get hot under the collar, you tend to fight more. Then you have waterborne diseases, you have vector borne diseases, uh, mosquitoes, they breed as the heat goes up. As human beings wilt and become listless in the heat, the mosquitoes become athletic and start climbing to higher altitudes where they were not previously present. So malaria can spread to other places. Extreme weather events, floods, droughts, cyclones, exacerbated air pollution, climate refugees, increased risk of chronic diseases as well, impact on agriculture and nutrition security. Again as temperature rises, for every one degree rise in centigrade in temperature, there is a 7 to 10 percent fall in the productivity of staples, particularly in South Asia and Africa where you are already operating at a pretty high level of susceptibility to rice and wheat growth. The quality of nutrient quality also decreases with increasing carbon dioxide levels. So staples as well as non-staples are affected and fruit, they ripen early, they rot early and therefore even the limited amount of fruit that we are consuming may also be in jeopardy. So with all these effects of climate change, again, who are more likely to be vulnerable, the poor. So that is the dimension that I would like to point out that all of us are vulnerable, but there are some who are more vulnerable than others. So how can public policy impact health? Because one of the questions that was asked to me before I came for the lecture is, let's look at how health can be shaped by public policy because of most of you, hopefully, are going to be steering some element of public policy, if not in the government, even in the private sector or anywhere else. Some link with public policy would be there. And we all hope that you would be rooting for health. But let's take one prime example, which is universal health coverage. Now, universal health coverage has been defined by WHO as when all people receive the quality health services, they need without suffering financial hardship. And SDG has put up also the Sustainable Development Goal, target 3.8, to achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential health care services, and access to safe, effective, quality and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all by 2030. Now, is it possible to achieve all of this? I mean, all health services for everybody without financial cost to the person seems a bit of a pipe dream. But you also recognize that you have to have some method of progressing towards that goal in stages. And WHO conveniently again has given us a cube, three-dimensional, in which there is one dimension called population coverage. How many, what is the proportion of population covered by any scheme? Whether it is RSBY or Aishman Bharat, what is the proportion of people covered by any scheme? Then there is service coverage. What is the range of services provided under the scheme? Third is cost coverage. What is the amount of financial protection provided? under the scheme. Now, different perspectives will emerge from different stakeholder groups. Politicians would be bothered about population coverage. The larger the number of people covered, the greater the number of satisfied voters, right? I'm not saying that they're not noble people and not bothered about equity. But let us accept that, like the economic man, they're also a bit selfish, right? Okay. Now, as far as healthcare providers are concerned, the doctors in hospitals would say, I want the best for my patient. Whether it is cochlear implant or renal transplant or renal dialysis or cardiac stents, I want the best for my patient. So whatever resources are there must go into the best possible service package. And most of the people in primary healthcare will not have a voice there. It's the hospitals that will actually set the mandate. Now, the people who are looking at cost coverage, economists, health system managers, people in the Niti Aayogs and planning commissions and so on, they'll be looking at, okay, how much of financial protection can we provide? How much of poverty reduction can we can achieve? At the same time, observing fiscal prudence so that the budget doesn't go bust, right? 
So there's a dynamic tension between these three groups. So as we expand the group, expand the cube, I mean fill in the cube, with increasing resources at each stage, we have to balance the tension and try and see how much in each dimension can be covered. So to guide us, we have cost effectiveness and people do come up with cost effectiveness analysis. How much health for how much expenditure? How much health will the money buy? But some economists now, like Larry Summers and Dean Jameson and others say, you must have an extended cost effectiveness analysis in looking at how much of financial protection also it will buy. Because there could be some conditions which may appear to be more costly, but if their economic consequences to the person and the family are quite catastrophic and are likely to be quite huge, then they are like you, you lose the financial protection. So you may also want to fit that into the package, like cardiovascular, for example. Now, this identifies ways to avoid poverty due to individuals paying for health services in excess. Now, how does UHC come in? You have a purchaser and a provider and the models vary across countries. The purchaser in most places where UHC has succeeded, substantially tax funded. So government is one purchaser. Then you have social insurance, which is either payroll deduction or even government subsidized like RSBY. Employer provided insurance, privately purchased insurance. But most of them would like to see a single payer system so that you can create a large risk pool and take the advantage of a single payer system. The provider, public sector certainly, private sector, for-profit, non-profit, I'm not listing the for-profiteering private sector here, I'm only listing the for-profit and non-profit, and so-called public-private partnerships. The government's role is as a guarantor and a regulator not necessarily as the sole provider. Provide it must, but not necessarily as the sole provider because quite often in a mixed health system you have to draw in the other sectors as well. And here we also have to bring in the equity dimension. We can't go into only the issue of cost effectiveness and extended cost effectiveness analysis. And here we have equity in two dimensions. Horizontal equity, equity which is universal access to a common set of services. The package is common to all, which is an essential health package that you have defined. But in order to bridge the huge health equity gaps that exist between regions, between population groups, you may have to provide special services or have an additional resource allocation for ensuring that services are delivered better. And that is where there is additional targeted services for disadvantaged or vulnerable groups, that is services beyond the essential health package. That's the vertical equity. So the role of the government is to be a provider through strengthened public sector and contracted private sector, public financing from tax revenues and subsidizing some of the social insurance programs, pooling, that is a single payer system to create a large risk pool because the principle of insurance operates even if the government is paying entirely through the tax funding. That is, the healthy subsidize, cross-subsidize the sick, the rich cross-subsidize the poor, the young cross-subsidize the elderly in a proper system. Purchasing, strategic purchasing using the power of monopsony. That means you have a single purchaser, multiple providers and you can negotiate the price. For example, if you are buying quality assured generic drugs like Tamil Nadu Dive, then there are multiple providers, you can set the terms, you can bargain, eliminate the middlemen, reduce the cost to one third. So the government can be a very important purchaser in that sense. So this is monopsony versus monopoly. Regulation of standards, quality, price, ethics and education. Regulatory function becomes very important for the government. Now for strategic purchasing, there are two models which have been proposed even in the national health policy. One is called the capitation fee model, which has nothing to do with capitation colleges, but which is actually payment for a set of services, whatever they may be, required 
for an individual who is being covered over a year or a family that's being covered over a year. That means if I am as a government paying 1200 rupees for individual X, the provider will have to cover all the services for that person whether the services cost 600 rupees that year or whether they cost 6000 rupees that year. Now you may say how does that work because you are paying not just for one person, you are paying for 1000 or 10,000 people and all of them are not going to fall sick that year. Most of them will not utilize whatever money is allocated. So the cost subsidization principle works and therefore the capitation fee works. But the capitation fee works best when your primary, secondary and tertiary care services are very clearly linked. Like in the Kaiser Permanente system in the U US in some states or in the NHS in uh, UK where if you focus a lot on health promotion, disease prevention, early detection, cost effective care, you are preventing a large number of complications which are likely to go for advanced secondary or tertiary care. If you treat hypertension and diabetes very effectively early, then you are preventing renal dialysis and cardiac stents and cardiac coronary bypass surgery or renal transplantation. So you are actually saving by doing better medical care, better health care in the primary level. Of course, the disadvantage can be what's called rationing of care. I may not want to send a patient for care even if the person requires. That's where standard management guidelines and technical audits come in. But overall it works best for good health. Now, accountability care of Obama built in some of those features, uh, though it failed for other reasons. Now, a fee-for-service model, on the other hand, says that for every single procedure, every single hospitalization, every single consultation, you are going to get a separate bill, which is an incentive for doctors were not particularly ethical to do more procedures, to have more hospitalizations, to call the patient for more revisits and charge much more. Now that can be quite counterproductive, particularly in a universal health coverage type of scheme. Unfortunately, the national health policy said for primary health care we will go for a capitation fee model and for secondary and tertiary care we will go for a fee for service. That doesn't make sense. Because actually it introduces a perverse incentive for the primary care provider because if I were the primary care provider then I would start shunting off all patients in secondary and tertiary care and save my money. So we need to correct some of these design flaws. Now what about the National Rural Health Mission which has become the National Health Mission and the RSBY which were greatly advertised. The National Rural Health Mission actually brought in a great deal of improvement in the maternal and child health services but ignored non-communicable diseases, mental health and all other areas and even this was patchy in terms of actual delivery of services because of poor investment in human resources for health for lacking adequate number of people to deliver the services. The Rashtriya Swasthya Bhima Yojana actually set out with an intent of providing initially people in the informal workforce but also including others as well uh, in the vulnerable sections with some degree of protection against hospitalized catastrophic expenditure. But with only 30,000 coverage and also a lot of induced demand from the hospitals, uh, there were a lot of problems and they, uh, it also did not provide uh, financial protection, particularly because outpatient care and medicines were not being covered. So well intended, but not very successful. So in 2010, the Planning Commission of India appointed a high-level expert group for universal health coverage. I chaired it along with a number of other independent experts and we came up with recommendations to adopt universal health coverage as a national commitment to be initiated in 2012 and fulfilled by 2022. Commit at least 2.5% of the GDP. At that time it was only 1%. still is about 1.2% of the GDP which is our public financing. Uh, in, during the 12th plan that meets in 2012 and 2017 and increase it to a minimum of 3% by the next plan period. So keep increasing it till at least you reach about 50 to 60% of the expenditure is not out of pocket, is public finance. 
conduct a review of government and uh, funded and uh, insurance schemes and merge all of them into a single universal health coverage framework. But whatever you are doing, prioritize primary health care, allocate about two-thirds to seventy percent of the funds to primary health care, provide essential drugs free of cost because that's the low-hanging fruit where people can get, at least in public facilities, because that's where people can get the immediate early relief from out-of-pocket expenditure. Uh, establish credible and effective regulatory systems, enable community participation and so on. Unfortunately, the slowdown in economic growth as well as the greater priority according to the Food Security Act meant that though the 12th plan did include some of these recommendations, they were never really implemented. But again, you look at public policy, we are talking about public policy here, why public policy is vital. and. It's not only doctors who are doing this, most of it is done by you. Whether it is production in the public sector or private sector, by domestic industry or multinational corporations, again public policy has, is very important. In terms of drug quality, standards and testing laboratories, in terms of pricing, pricing of drugs in the national list of essential medicines as well as others, procurement, pool procurement, public procurement of quality assured generics, we spoke about that. Supply chain, how do we establish warehouses and prevent stockouts, stock monitoring. So all of this is a part of public policy. Sale of quality assured generics to generation these stores. But trade agreements, I understand a lot of you are interested in trade, of course, uh, despite Mr. Trump. But nevertheless, we find that international free trade agreements are now introducing insidiously a number of provisions which defeat the letter and intent of the Doha Declaration. Through so these TRIPS Plus provisions, they are actually reducing the ability of countries to use compulsory licensing mechanism. They are limiting export to third countries. And worst of all, Previously, WTO dispute settlement mechanism meant only intergovernmental dispute settlement mechanism. Now, getting the investor dispute settlement into the picture, they are allowing an investor also to challenge the government, and we are finding odd cases, not so odd cases, that are increasing now, like Philip Morris setting up an office in Hong Kong and Singapore to challenge the government of Australia on packaging, on plain packaging, or challenging some government of Uruguay and so on. So, using some of the FTA mechanisms to undermine uh, some of the uh, pu public health measures. So, this is where, again, we have to be extremely careful in seeing how public policy can be protective of access to medicines. And now, Aishman Bharat is here. Uh, health and Wellness Centers, Comprehensive Primary Health Care has been declared as Health and Wellness Centers advancing that. Uh, it was launched in Chhattisgarh. We are all in favor of good primary health care, led by very strengthened primary health care outposts at the sub-center level, but it requires human resources who are well-trained, adequate numbers, a multi-layered, multi-skilled health workforce, including what are called mid-level health care providers. We don't have them right now. We're training them in a hurry, but we need to actually ensure that they are really empowered and even technologically enabled. The National Health Protection Mission, PMJ, was launched in Jharkhand. Now, the problem, of course, is that you are covering only 40% of the population because you are taking the socio-economic and caste census and taking the bottom 40%. Good, because here again you are trying to say at least the most vulnerable must be protected. But what about the remaining 60%? About maximum of 20% get, you know, central government health service, railways, armed forces, ESI, private insurance and others, less than 20% actually. So what about the other 40% sandwiched in between? Many of them are very vulnerable. So how does it amount to universal health coverage? What do we do for them? Since we may not be able to give all the money to them as well, 5 lakhs is a reasonable amount, do we at least create a single risk pool by giving them an opportunity to enter this scheme through income graded premiums but still create a large risk pool? That's a possibility, we should think of it. Some of the states have said no, because many of them through their pre-existing schemes are beneficiaries of 80 to 84 percent. 
they say, they say, okay, if you are shrinking it to 40%, what do we do with others? And some others are refusing because of co-branding and branding issues. But nevertheless, we are now making a move towards universal health coverage. We are not there yet, but we are at least taking some steps towards it. So if we are to envision universal health coverage in 2019, India needs to evolve a framework which features mandatory coverage for all population groups, contributions from those who can afford them, with subsidization to those who cannot, decreasing the number of pools and schemes in the country to increase efficiency, concentration on a comprehensive benefit package for all people in all schemes, increased allocation for public health services, and reliance on strategic purchasing, and provide portability across the country. Any scheme of universal health coverage must have portability. If I was born in Chennai, educated in Hyderabad and work in Delhi, I must have the assurance of portability of my scheme. If I am a laborer in Odisha who seasonally migrates to Haryana or Punjab, I must have the benefit of portability. So that is an important element that needs to be built in as well. So finally, I am not done with my Nobel laureate economists as yet. So I am trying to impress the DSC with my knowledge of Nobel laureate economists. Gunnar Myrdal in 1974 who wrote the Asian drama along with his wife. He said, health leaps out of science and draws nourishment from the totality of society. So it is really the other elements of society that shape health substantially. So urban design and transport, is it supportive of active living? How are we providing protection from air, water, food and soil pollution? Are we, how are we looking at road safety? So many of our young people are dying on the roads. Climate change mitigation, our own institute in Ahmedabad, we have five institutes, the Indian Institute of Public Health, they have drawn up a health, uh, heat protection plan, which has actually worked. They, they have shown that by adopting that, the Ahmedabad municipality has reduced the mortality spikes during heat spikes. Food and agriculture, so obviously you are looking at number of elements of food, whether it's production point of view or the consumer point of view or the processing point of view, all of these you are seeing in the food supply, food marketing, food transformation and retail and food demand. Multiple forces that are shaping. This is again public policy because ultimately what gets to reach an individual in terms of nutrient food and provides nutrition security, not just food security, is this admixture of public policy in various levels and impacts food choices. So we need to create a climate resilient, climate smart agriculture with crop diversity which gives dietary diversity, sustainable fish production, fiber preserving food grain processing, non-atherogenic and non-diabetogenic processed food products, food safety against carcinogens. Again all of this is public policy which impacts on health. The power of policy is that it modifies the social and economic determinants of behaviors. It influences how people eat, smoke, drink or move. Creates enabling environment to initiate and maintain behavior change in communities and individuals. Can impact on multiple risk factors simultaneously. If I'm impacting on food, I'm impacting blood pressure, blood cholesterol, diabetes, everything. Reduces population risk in a short time, cost effective relatively easy to implement and has intergenerational benefit. You create smoke-free public places, easy to walk, community parks, protected cycling lanes, safe pedestrian pathways. It benefits not only you but the next generation as well. And we have seen this happen in the area of tobacco where taxation, advertising bans, smoke-free policies, health warnings all have now evidence behind them that they work. Taxation is considered to be the most effective instrument for tobacco control world over, shown in different countries, including South Africa and France. But we have not taxed BDs and oral tobacco adequately. And uh, they say tobacco is more addictive to governments than to people themselves. Okay. In UK, they showed that 48.1% of the mortality averted during between 1981 and 2000 was attributable to reduced smoking. 
diet again lot of initiatives the which edible oil is available in your public distribution system how are your fruit and vegetables processed and subsidized tax on sugar sweet and beverages now mexico is showing evidence of benefit in terms of reduced consumption uh, of uh, sugar sweet and beverages with increased taxation uk has adopted it now food labeling reduced salt in fast processed foods ban on trans fats advertising restrictions particularly of uh, in children's programs advertising a lot of junk foods which uk and others are doing so a lot of public policy actually can go into protecting health now you may say what about the role of the market because ultimately the economists will have to consider the role of the market so our plea would be that we need to mold the markets to become more sensitive and aligned to public health interests the market cannot be an autonomous entity totally impervious to public health concerns so you need to promote consumer consciousness try and nudge or steer or regulate industry practices so that you can point out the benefits of public private partnerships and so on health dividend because a healthy society is good for business but also develop a national policy framework through political economic and social motivators incentives and disincentives a carrot and a stick i call it a frozen carrot policy can be both an incentive and a, a disincentive it can be both a stick and a carrot so use policy well at the same time global agreements like the global agreement on tobacco control the framework convention on tobacco control so some of these are important instruments of, of policy but say choice where is the choice now the libertarians will say where is the choice you are limiting you are getting in a very nanny state okay choice can be conscious conditioned or compelled it conscious based on right information well informed or even on wrong information conditioned by marketing and promotion aggressive marketing by tobacco industry alcohol industry and so on or even junk foods all kinds of foods nutraceuticals cultural factors but compelled or constrained also by availability and affordability i may tell people to go and consume five helpings of fruit and vegetable per day but if the prices in the market put it beyond them then what are they going to do even if they have all the knowledge so in this whole business of state versus market where does public policy stand often we find here the argument of a nanny state that why is the government trying to interfere in becoming a nanny but the government has a responsibility to protect public health it cannot abdicate that responsibility the role of the market can the market align with the public health goals ideally yes to the extent possible we should try and incentivize also that kind of a movement but certainly it has to align because in the larger societal interest paul collier who has recently written a book on uh, the future of capitalism uh he wants of course neither a very strict left or a right solution he prefers a communitarian foundation for a altered social democratic kind of approach but he wants capitalism to move with a reformation so paul collier says we need an active state but we need one that accepts a more modest role we need the market but hardness by a purpose securely grounded in ethics now the purpose okay now has market recognized that purpose i'm not so sure some elements may have some have not so till that purpose is clearly aligned to public interest and ethics are defined in terms of protecting common good governments should not relax their regulatory role that would be my public health position and policy clearly needs interdisciplinary research bismarck the man came so as a man of blood and iron the chancellor in germany in the 19th century said there are two things that should not be watched while they are being made sausages and public policy and it is fine spectacles right but enlightened policy can be made and that requires scientific credibility evidence and rationale financial feasibility is it cost effective is it affordable 
because everything that's cost effective is not necessarily affordable. Operational stability, is it only pilots or it can be sustained, it can be scaled? Political viability, is there a ready and receptive constituency among the general public as well as among the policy makers who are the lobbies opposing it, who are the lobbies supporting it? So you need research for each of these. For the first you need biomedical, clinical and epidemiological research. For the second you need health economics research. For the third you need health systems research or implementation research as they call it now. And for the fourth you require social sciences research. You need all of these to come together. So in the Public Health Foundation of India, here comes the blurb, uh, the Public Health Foundation of India, we have all of these in one platform, in one family. We have epidemiology and allied sciences. We have environmental and life sciences. We have humanities and social sciences. We have economics and management. We have people dealing with health economics and financing, health systems management, health technologies, monitoring and evaluation sociology, anthropology, behavioral and communication sciences, epidemiology, biostatistics, data management, demography, people dealing with human health and nutrition, animal health, planetary health. So, you're welcome to come and join forces. But let me end again with one other reminder about equality. We stopped with John Rawls talking about equality of opportunity and we sort of take that as the bottom line of equality. But is it equality of opportunity or equality also of social circumstances? Somebody whom I admire greatly, he was a British economist, not very well renowned now, R.H. Tony. He was a Christian socialist, they called him, because he was also a theologian. In the 1920s wrote a book called Equality. And, uh, of course, he also wrote other books like Religion and the Rise of Capitalism and so on. But in equality, he says, what is required is not only an open road, but an equal start. You may give equality of opportunity, but if you are undernourished, if you have been poor, you have lived in very poor social circumstances, how capable are you of utilizing that equality of opportunity to gain ground, like anybody else who has had a better social circumstance? So he emphasizes the social circumstances as well. In fact, he describes talking only about equality of opportunity as decorous drapery. So, ultimately, I will have to conclude my lecture. So as uh, Henry the Second said to Henry, Henry the Eighth said to his second wife, "I'll not keep you long." Okay. So, as William Gibson said, the future is already here. It is not just very evenly distributed. So, we need universal health coverage. Financial protection most certainly necessary but not sufficient. Social determinants of health, multi-sectoral action. Policy, health in all policies. And empowered communities with a rights-based approach to health. As Simone Weil said, attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>